for usage pattern. That's a position it holds today. So, um, some that are interested in the genomes of natural populations and they go in processes like local adaptation, speciation, and demographic changes. And they ask questions or try to get answers to questions such as what is the role of natural selection on driving the emergence of new species? What are the consequences of hybridization? between emerging species and how does the structure and organization of the genome affect adaptation or species barriers? They also do some gene students do some what equals day to day work and that involves bioinformatic analysis of genomic data. Um, they also read butterflies, I'm reading butterflies because that this is with the experiments done. And um, I know it travels around the world, and just for fun, they do field trips in tropical places, and more recently in Rwanda, I think. So Simon is a very productive researcher. He published many papers in very prestigious journals. Simon, I think I've said enough now, and we are looking very much forward to your talk. I am. Um, convinced that there will be many take-home messages and things that we can learn from you. And once again, thank you for taking the time to give this presentation. So I will hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Martin, for that very kind introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. Is that working? I assume that's working, although I can't hear anyone. Um, it's working, Simon. Great. Thanks, Brenda. Um, okay. Yes. So my talk today is uh, about genome rearrangements. Um, and as Martin pointed out, the type of things that I work on that my group has been working on tend to be more population level processes. And we've been thinking a lot about how genome rearrangements impact um, things like hybridization and gene flow between species. Um, in this talk, I'm going to try and uh, make the link between those population level processes and what they mean for systematic biology and thinking about longer term evolution and phylogenies. Um, but it's an easy link to make, of course, because when we look at phylogenies, we're really looking at the outcome of long term processes that act at the, at the level of populations. So um, I'm going to divide the talk into three bits. Uh, the first is going back to work I did from my PhD and into my um, time as a junior research fellow, working with Chris Jiggins um, and a postdoc John Davey on Heliconius butterflies. And that's on the indirect effect of ancient chromosome fusions. Um, the second part is work by Alex McIntosh, who is a PhD student who's just finishing here in Edinburgh, co-supervised by Conrad Lozer. And Alex um, has been working on more direct effects of chromosome fusions and fissions um, on species boundaries in Brenthus fritillary butterflies. Um, and then finally, I'll show some new results from our lab um, on the African Danaeus butterflies. This is work by two postdocs, Kangwu Kim and Rishi Dekine, who are both former postdocs in my group. Um, and this is on inversions um, that are polymorphic in the population that have quite surprising histories. Um, after this slide, I feel obliged to say I don't only work with men. Um, that just happens to be what I'm talking about today. Uh, I thought to prove this, I'd show a, a photo from a recent lab meeting. So this is um, a snapshot of uh, what the group looks like at the moment, or at least did a few months ago. Um, so in the previous slide, I was talking about different types of rearrangements. I thought I'd just do a quick refresher here, the three types I mentioned. So chromosome fusions, of course, are when two chromosomes come together to form one. Chromosome fissions occur when a chromosome breaks into two. And chromosomal inversions occur when part of the chromosome flips. Um, and each of these have different consequences um, for uh, population level evolution. Um, the other thing I'd like to justify is why all this work is on butterflies. Um, and this is one reason um, that this is an interesting group to study in this context. 
this slide shows a phylogeny of, um, I don't know, like a, about around 100 species. I should know the number. This is from a, a recent preprint by Charlotte Wright, who works on the Darwin Tree of Life project, um, who are making chromosome level assemblies for all the UK species. Um, and column B here shows the number of chromosomes in each lepidopteran. So these are butterflies and moths. Um, and you see that a large number of these species have nearly identical chromosome numbers. Almost all of them have 31 chromosomes to be precise. Um, and uh, well, that's that's the haploid number, one sex chromosome and 30 autosomes. And some of these species have been stable in their chromosome number for 250 million years since this node back here. Um, whereas others shown in yellow have experienced change. So in the LEPs, there seems to be this kind of punctuated situation where there is uh, a lot of stability in chromosome structure, but then periods of change, sometimes dramatic change. And sometimes those periods of change end and, uh, and the chromosome structure becomes stable again. Um, and so those are the kinds of groups that we're going to be looking at today when thinking about the consequences of these changes. So the first uh, of the three parts is on Heliconius butterflies. This is um, a neotropical genus. Um, they're very well known for their bright colors. Their colors are warning patterns um, that warn predators that they are distasteful. And this group is thought of as an adaptive radiation. There are about 45 species, um, and they're thought to have formed through adaptive processes as these species have adapted to different ecologies. Um, there's also a lot of color pattern divergence that affects speciation. There's also convergent, convergence in color pattern between some species that mimic one another's warning pattern. Um, and so it's a very good genus for studying the consequences of recent speciation um, and hybridization. And something else that's interesting about Heliconius is they're one of the, these groups that have uh, a different number of chromosomes. So this little tree here shows two Heliconius species and then two outgroup genera. And we see that there are 31 chromosomes in both outgroup genera, whereas uh, Heliconius have 21 chromosomes. And that's the result of 10 fusions that occurred over a reasonably short period in the history of uh, the ancestor of all Heliconius. And those 10 fusions very neatly happened between a set of short chromosomes and a set of long ones. So Heliconius went from having 30 autosomes to having 20 autosomes, uh, 10 in green that are unfused, and then 10 in purple that are now fused. Um, so in this talk, I'll just be talking about three Heliconius species that are quite well studied um, and are known to hybridize in the wild. Um, their geography is an important part of the story. The first is called Heliconius melpomene. That's the one shown in sort of pink red here. Um, and that's found throughout um, South America and into Central America on both sides of the Andes Mountains, which is this dashed line here. Heliconius sydno on the other side is only found on the west of the Andes, and it hybridizes with melpomene on the west of the Andes. And then Heliconius timoretta is found on the eastern slopes of the Andes, and it hybridizes with melpomene on those eastern slopes. Um, and although this Timoretta looks like Malpomene, it's actually more closely related to Sydno, at least that's the understood species tree. Um, it has more similar ecology to Sydno. They tend to occur in more primary forest, like this photo on the left, whereas Malpomene tend to occur in more secondary growth um, forest, like this photo on the right. In addition to habitat preference, they have different host plant usage. They have very strong assortative mating. So hybrids do occur, but around one in a thousand or less. Um, hybrid females are sterile. So that's the example of Haldane's rule. So in general, these are very good species, but they speciated recently and early phylogenetic studies already showed that the phylogeny of, of these three, this, this three taxon clade is very messy. Um, and so a lot of what I thought about during my PhD and the, thereafter was how do we make sense of such messy phylogenies? Um, and so to get at this, we made a, a large data set of whole genome data from um, multiple locations where different populations are sympatric. And in total, we, we sa sampled um, kind of eight pop populations in sympatry where Sydno uh, co-occurs with Malpomene in the west of the Andes. Um, and where Timoretta occurs with Malpomene on the east of the Andes. So there's two opportunities for gene flow in the west of the Andes between Sydno and the western Malpomene, and in the east of the Andes between Sydno and the eastern Malpomene. And this tree here shows the 
uh, what is believed to be the, the species branching pattern for these taxa. But of course, depending where you look in the genome, you might not see exactly that. And that's, um, that's the it's kind of the problem and the interesting part of this story. So uh, a brief detour to talk about how we quantify um, complex relationships. This is something I've thought quite a bit about. And in 2017, we proposed a method um, to deal with this, um, which I'll just explain with this example. So say we have this tree, this represents the genealogy for one locus in the genome, and we've got 10 individuals from four different groups, but they're not monophyletic. Um, and there are two reasons for that. The one is incomplete lineage sorting. So there are two lineages here from population C that only coalesce in an ancestral population. And they actually coalesce first, some of them with uh, individuals from population D. So some individuals from group C are more closely related to D. Um, and then there's gene flow over here that connects some individuals from population B with a most recent common ancestor uh, shared with an individual from population C. So again, some individuals from B and C are more closely related than um, individuals from B, R to A. Um, but this is not monophyletic, so the pattern varies depending on which individual you look at. And of course, the other complication is that this is going to vary depending where we look in the genome. As we slide along the genome, the genealogy for a set of individuals will vary with recombination events. Um, and so how do we summarize this messy situation into something that we can talk about and quantify? So our approach says, well, let's take this genealogy for a given slice of the genome, and we can get that slice by taking a very small number of SNPs. Um, in this study, we use 50 SNPs at a time. Another way to do that would be to use a method that infers not only the trees, but also their breakpoints and where they vary along the genome. There are a few methods that can do that nowadays. Um, and we unroot that tree. And then we can summarize this tree in terms of three possible subtree topologies. Um, and these are the subtree topologies here, one in which A individuals are most closely related to B individuals, one in which A is most closely related to C, and a third one in which A is most closely related to D. Um, and if we subsample one tip from each of these groups, um, we can then ask, what's the shape of this subtree that we've subsampled? And in this case, it matches the first topology. And we can do that over and over again, subsampling different sets of one tip from each group. Um, and each time we can record which topology we see. And if we do that exhaustively, eventually we get the total number of times we saw each of these topologies, and we call these topology weights. And in the case of this tree, 86% of the time, individuals from A are most closely related to individuals from B. Um, and 12% of the time, A is most closely related to D, and only 2% of the time with C. Um, this kind of makes sense because uh, the most common one is the one that follows the species branching pattern, A grouping with B. Um, the second most common one groups B with C, and that is the result of these two migration events, these two gene flow events that connect individuals from B with C. So we could now slide along the genome and summarize the entire genome in this way. Um, and we did that in the Heliconius case um, with these four in-groups that I mentioned before. We also added an out-group here to try to polarize this. And that meant that instead of three topologies, we now had 15 possible subtree topologies we could look at. And this bar chart here shows the genome-wide proportions of each of these subtree topologies. You don't really need to look at each of them. The main point here is just that there is no single tree topology that wins out. It's a very messy and um, incoherent pattern. Um, and we could go through each one of these and explain or talk about what processes might contribute to us seeing that tree topology. But um, today, I'm just going to focus on two of these that are most interesting. The first one is this blue one here, T3. This one groups the two Melpomenes together, and that follows what we believe is the species branching pattern. Um, the second one is this yellowish one, T6, and that groups Sid with Mel from the west of the Andes and Timoretto with Mel from the east of the Andes. So that groups individuals according to geography. Um, and that is consistent with gene flow occurring in the sympatric populations. So if we step back and look at what this looks like across the genome, just with these two topologies now, we get this messy pattern where 
the yellow topology consistent with geography is seen on all the chromosomes at a similar level, whereas the blue topology, which we believe captures the species branching pattern, uh, has these narrow spikes on some chromosomes and is particularly well supported on the Z sex chromosome. So butterflies have a ZW system, females have a Z and W and males are ZZ. And we actually expected this exact result because in Heliconius, it had already been shown, at least in this set, that the Z chromosome contains alleles that cannot intergress into the other species background because they cause this female hybrid sterility. And so that's um, going to prevent exchange of genes and create a, a stronger species barrier, so more support for the species topology on that chromosome. But what about all these other spikes of the species topology on the autosomes? How can we explain those? Um, well, if you look long enough, you'll notice that they often occur near the centers and also near the ends of chromosomes. So this summarizes that here, with zero being chromosome centers and one being chromosome ends, we get the most uh, support for species tree topologies near chromosome centers, um, and then again at chromosome ends. But away from that, we get more support for this geography topology. So what goes on at the chromosome centers and ends? Uh, one of the things is that these are regions of low recombination rate. So this second plot here shows the recombination rate and how it varies. So how frequent crossovers are during meiosis. And we see wherever we get blue spikes, not all of the time, but for most of these blue peaks, we see a dip in the local recombination rate. But there's another broad pattern by the way, I'm going to explain why we see this pattern in a couple slides time. I just want to talk about this other broad pattern, which is not so clear to the naked eye, which is that there are 10 chromosomes on which these spikes are more prominent. And those happen to be the 10 long chromosomes that I mentioned that became fused in deep in the ancestor of Heliconius. So all of these species have these fusions, but the, these chromosomes are longer. And we can see that here that the species tree in blue is has a higher weighting on the, the fused chromosomes than on the short unfused ones. So uh, both of these patterns, the spikes in the chromosome centers and ends, and the general increase in species topology on long chromosomes seem to be associated with lower recombination rates. Um, so why might that be the case? Well, uh, first of all, uh, these long chromosomes um, and have lower recombination rates. That's that's something I should first convince you of. So if we look here on the left, uh, the long chromosomes um, have longer, the fused chromosomes have longer length in terms of base pairs, megabases. But on the right-hand side of this plot, these long chromosomes don't have longer map lengths, or at least not significantly longer. So the map length is the number of crossovers per hundred individuals that we see in crosses. And so this tells us that as these chromosomes became longer, they didn't increase in the number of average number of crossovers per meiosis. And so that means the number of crossovers per base pair has gone down subsequent to these fusions. Um, and when we look at this relationship with chromosome length, we see that actually it, it doesn't seem to be bimodal. It seems to be a gradual effect of the length of the chromosome. So as chromosomes get longer, the number of crossovers for, per base pair decreases. So why, uh, why recombination rate? Why would that be driving these phylogenetic patterns we see? There are two reasons uh, that might explain this. The first one is just about effective population size. So um, a process called linked selection tends to reduce uh, effective population size when recombination is low. So linked selection occurs whenever selection acts, um, when a mutation that is beneficial spreads to fixation in the population, it tends to drag with it a haplotype of, of, uh, uh, of mutations that are linked, that are in LD with that beneficial mutation. And so that reduces genetic diversity. It's reduced the effective population size in this part of the genome. And this effect will be more dramatic if there's low recombination rate, because recombination is the only way that these linked mutations will escape being dragged to fixation with this selective sweep. Um, and a separate process occurs when deleterious mutations, shown here in red, are removed from the population. Those uh, tend to remove with them other linked mutations on the same haplotype that reduces the total number of 
haplotypes present in the population and again reduces the effective population size. And again, this effect is most uh, efficient when recombination rate is low. So low recombination regions tend to have lower effective population size. Um, and that affects the species tree or the, the, the topology of genealogies. This figure here comes from a nice paper making this point in 2013. If we think of, about uh, a case where we sampled two individuals from each of three taxa, and we trace them back in time until we find a common ancestor, that coalescence point, the larger the population, the deeper we'll have to go in time uh, on average before we find that common ancestor. So the deeper coalescence points will be. And they can be so deep that they occur in the ancestral population. And if that happens, such as this point I'm highlighting here, we can get the first coalescence actually happening between two non-sister taxa. And so here we have a genealogy that doesn't match the species topology. Um, when the effective population size is lower, coalescent times tend to be more close to the present because there are fewer ancestors um, contributing to the, the present day population. Uh, and so there's less opportunity for that incomplete lineage sorting and the these coalescences that give us discordant topologies. Um, and this has been seen almost wherever people look. In this particular study, they showed that in humans, the species tree human chimp gorilla is better supported in parts of the genome with low recombination rates um, than in high recombination rates. And a similar pattern was seen in a Drosophila phylogeny. So that's the first mechanism. The second mechanism is one that um, has received less attention, and it occurs when there's also gene flow going on. So uh, to explain this, let's imagine a population that receives uh, gene flow. It receives a foreign chrom chromosome shown in red here. And this foreign chromosome, this introgressing chromosome, carries deleterious mutations shown with these little bumps. And these mutations might not be deleterious in the donor species, but they have some cost in the recipient genetic background. So over time, if this, if this uh, introgression isn't lethal, it will have opportunities to break down through recombination. And so we have haplotypes from the donor population uh, of different sizes in our recipient population. And some of these carry more deleterious mutations than others. And those which carry more deleterious mutations have more opportunity to be removed by selection or more potential to be removed by selection. And so the end result is in parts of the genome where there's less recombination, there tend to be larger blocks that are more likely to carry deleterious mutation and are more likely to be purged by selection. And so this selective barrier against uh, introgression is strongest in parts of the genome where recombination rates are low. It tends to be weakest on chromosome ends, uh, regardless of recombination rate, um, because of a uh, a reduction in in the, the opportunities or the, the potential of li being linked to one of these deleterious mutations on chromosome ends. So that kind of goes against this prediction or this this data that we saw showing higher um, uh, higher species tree support on the chromosome end. But there's two things going on on chromosome ends because recombination rates drop on the ends of these chromosomes. Um, but uh, there is also this less linkage to deleterious mutations. So there's a bit of a tension between two forces there. But if we think about this process on average, longer chromosomes should have less gene flow. Um, so to quantify that in this 2019 study, we used a, a statistic that we had developed a few years before to quantify um, the admixture proportion to how what proportion of the population is uh, composed of introgressed fragments from a donor population. And to do that, we compare two sympatric populations and we use an allopatric kind of control population. And the statistic indeed showed us that as we get longer chromosomes, we tend to see lower levels of introgression. Um, not all chromosomes conform to this. Of course, there'll be some other chromosomes that contribute more strongly to the species barrier for other reasons, um, but a general trend here. And this trend does seem to be stronger in one of our pairs than in the other. We don't fully understand why, um, but if you think back to that introgressing chromosome with all those deleterious mutations, you need a high density of deleterious mutations for this process to work, for, this, for there to be an average reduction in the amount of introgression with decreasing recombination rate. 
So one possibility is that the species pair on the left simply has more polygenic species barrier, so more deleterious mutations spread out throughout the genome, which gives rise to a more predictable pattern in the species barrier. All right, I'm going to move on now to the next part of this talk. Um, I know I've already used up about half of my time, but don't worry, the next two parts are, are a lot shorter. Um, so we've been talking about these ancient chromosome fusions that, uh, that made these chromosomes longer and the effects of these chromosomes being longer um, that persists throughout evolution. This next part is about recent chromosome fusions and fissions that differ between species. So this is quite a familiar idea that species might differ in their carrier type in their, um, due to say a fusion that has occurred in species two that isn't in species one. Um, and if you, uh, I mean, so one of the classic examples of this is the mule, the hybrid between horse and donkeys. And if you go on the internet and you ask why are mules sterile, everybody will say, well, it's because the hybrids, the mules, have an, an uneven number of chromosomes and they can't segregate properly. Um, and that sort of seems to be taken as gospel. Of course, there's a big caveat in, in that argument, which is that uh, at some point, this chromosome fusion must have occurred in a single individual and spread through the population. So it must have occurred in heterozygotes before, and they must have been fertile to pass it on. So it cannot result in complete sterility. Um, and so there's probably a more subtle um, truth going on here where these chromosome rearrangements may affect fertility um, in some non uh, sort of uh, incomplete way. Um, and you can imagine why this would happen when this chromosome, when this when the cell splits during meiosis, these chromosomes might not correctly pull to the opposite ends of the cell, especially if they have paired in this conformation here, you could imagine the spindle binding and sort of tearing these chromosomes apart um, as this cell divides. So uh, although this is a very well-known mechanism, not a lot of work has been done to directly test the effects of these chromosome fissions and fusions um, on species barriers. And that's what Alex McIntosh worked on in, in, as part of his PhD. He studied these two species of fritillaries, Brenthus Daphne and Eno, and he showed that they have a, a well, it was already known they have a very reduced chromosome number, um, but they also differ um, not necessarily too much in their chromosome number, only by one chromosome in the number of chromosomes, but in their chromosome structure, there are five chromosomes that are rearranged between these two species. And these rearrangements are quite complex. They involve multiple fission and fusion events. And so Alex wanted to know whether these events result in stronger species barriers on these rearranged chromosomes. Um, and to do that, Alex took a different approach to the sort of phylogenetic one I had taken before. Instead, Alex used a demographic modeling approach um, using recently published software called Gimbal. Um, and this method tries to infer not only the rate of gene flow, which they call the effective migration rate. So this is the rate of migration of, of alleles between species after selection has acted. That's why it's the effective migration rate. This method is also affecting, uh, estimating the sizes, the effective sizes of each of the two species and the ancestral population, as well as the split time between the species. Um, and it does this by looking at short sequence blocks. Um, and very briefly, these short sequence blocks contain quite a lot of information about the shape of genealogies. This method isn't trying to infer the complete shape of a genealogy. It only uh, looks at a pair of individuals at a time, so four sequences from two diploid individuals. But even from a small number of individuals like this, there's a lot of information in these patterns of mutations. In this case, uh, we see a shared mutation A between two haplotypes from different populations and a shared mutation T at this other side between three haplotypes, again, from the different species. So that tells us that one of these haplotypes from this species one is actually most closely related to species two. So the genealogy here, although we haven't observed it, must look something like this, where one of the haplotypes from species one is coalescing first with species two, um, and that allows these mutations to be shared between species one and species two. Um, so that genealogy could result from gene flow, 
um, as shown here, or it could result from incomplete lineage sorting and coalescence back here. Um, but if we get enough of this information from enough of these short sequence blocks, many hundreds of thousands of them from across the genome and many pairs of individuals, then there's enough information to do a likelihood-based search for the optimal parameters um, that explain these patterns. And um, uh, the, yeah, this, this method, which is really developed by the lab of Conrad Loza, involves um, these very clever um, algorithms to compute those likelihoods of all of the possible demographic histories and infer the maximum likelihood one. Um, and then it goes a step further by inferring these histories for different windows across the genome. And in each of these windows, it now fixes the time of the species split, since that should be the same across the whole genome. But it allows this effective migration rate and the population sizes to vary. And so again, we're interested in finding parts of the genome that might have a lower or a higher effective rate of migration of gene flow between taxa. So Alex fitted uh, this model between these two species and found that in this case, the species split around 2 million years ago. Daphne has a much lower effective population size and seems to be the recipient of most of the gene flow from Eno. And then when the model was fitted along the genome, Alex found that this effective migration rate does indeed vary quite dramatically uh, uh, across the genome, at least the maximum likelihood estimates do. Um, and visually, there does seem to be an effect of these chromosome fusions. These chromosomes seem to have lower rates of effective migration than these um, chromosomes that have not been rearranged, with the exception of one over here, that's chromosome 11, which again happens to be the sex chromosome, the Z chromosome. So overall, a very similar um, result to what we saw in Heliconius. Um, looking at the relationship with chromosome length, we see that there is some effect of chromosome length, possibly, um, but the more important effect seems to be whether chromosomes are rearranged or not, as shown by, by the green color here. And some of these rearranged chromosomes have um, dramatically lower effective migration rates. Um, that's just shown here by these histograms, so lower effective migration on rearranged chromosomes. Um, and Alex wanted to know if the rearrangement itself is the cause of, of this, because that would be consistent with that model of reduced fertility um, or reduced fitness in hybrids caused specifically by that rearrangement locus, the, the, the part of the rearranged chromosome where the rearranged bits connect with one another. And Alex showed that within one megabase of those bits of the genome, we see an even lower effective migration rate. So it does seem to be the case that these rearrangements have reduced fitness um, in the hybrids, um, and that leads to stronger species barriers um, in, in those parts of the genome. So this is, uh, to our knowledge, some of the first direct evidence that these types of rearrangements of chromosomes are contributing to speciation. What we don't know is whether they were the first step in speciation or if these events happened later and, and other factors, almost certainly other factors are also contributing to the formation of these species. And uh, that's where I'll leave this part of the story and move on for the last 10 minutes or so to the third part, um, which is about inversions that are polymorphic in this genus Danaeus. These butterflies might look more familiar to those of you in South Africa. Um, this group um, is one we've been working on, not because it is uh, a group where there's been rapid speciation. In fact, this whole story is just about one species, but it's a species with quite a lot of phenotypic diversity that is associated with smaller chromosome rearrangements. So this is what the diversity looks like across the species range. There are these different morphs with different warning patterns. Um, so similar to Heliconius, these warning patterns um, are, uh, are variable in space, and they serve to, to warn predators that these butterflies are, are toxic. And they tend to be re reasonably monomorphic in any given location, but there's a big hybrid zone centered on um, Uganda, Rwanda, and Eastern DRC, where all of the morphs come together, and they interbreed freely in that hybrid zone. Um, and when you look at genetic differentiation, so this is FST measuring um, sort of allele frequency differences between populations, we see that actually 
almost throughout the range of this species, it's pretty much la one large panmictic population. So FST is close to zero, indicating no detectable um, allele frequency differences. Uh, and this is occurring over very long geographic distances, thousands of kilometers. So this is a very dispersive species that behaves like one large population. But there are these clear peaks, especially this big one here on chromosome 15, where these morphs, you, know, you could call them subspecies, uh, are clearly distinct and have very different um, allele frequencies. And so we've been mostly focused on these parts of the genome that differentiate these morphs. And when you see differentiation over a large tract like this, rather than a narrow peak, it does suggest that there is not only selection acting, but also uh, suppression of recombination such that the selection is keeping the species or these populations distinct over a, a broad tract of the genome. Um, this tract of the genome is also interesting because it's associated with some key phenotypes. The first is this four-wing black tip, which can be present or absent, um, which associates, um, this is looking at uh, a, a genome-wide association study mainly based on individuals from the hybrid zone where they interbreed and, and recombine. And we see that associates almost entirely with chromosome 15. And then another trait, a, a light or dark background coloration also associates very strongly with chromosome 15, although it does also associate with other loci in the genome. So we've been focusing on the structure of chromosome 15 to understand how um, these differences are maintained between these groups. <laughs> this is just zooming in uh, on those FST plots for chromosome 15, just to drive home the point that it's a very defined region of differentiation. Outside of this region, if we make a, a sort of phylogenetic network, we see no differentiation within this species. And within this region, um, we see very clear clustering into three groups. And these three groups each have different warning patterns. Um, so we were able to um, make reference or chromosome level genome assemblies for each of these three groups. And this is what chromosome 15 looks like in each of the groups. And the colored part just shows the part of the chromosome that is most different between them. And the first thing you'll probably notice is that this chromosome has a different length in each of these morphs. So we wanted to understand how these chromosomes have changed structurally from one another um, over time. And to do that, we compared them each to the outgroup which is Danaeus plexippus, the American monarch, which we think has um, the ancestral chromosome structure. And it also has a much shorter chromosome 15, as you can see. Uh, and when we look at syntony between these, we see there's, there's perfect syntony on the ends of the chromosomes. But in the middle of the chromosome, we see three inversions, in which this one of the morphs of Danaeus crispus is distinct uh, through three different events from the outgroup. Um, but there's another part of the chromosome that we haven't explained here, and that is this part, which is also inverted, um, but duplicated many, many times, often in small fragments. And that explains why this chromosome uh, in this one morph of Danaeus crispus is so much longer than that in the outgroup. So this is what we call a complex rearrangement, a large number of events um, that have occurred in the evolution of this one morph. And when we looked at the other two morphs, we saw that each of them also has a unique set of events. This morph on the bottom right, which is found in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia and Kenya, Somalia, um, it doesn't have the inversions. It only has all of these duplications. And that led us to think that perhaps these duplications of this tract of the genome, which is about a megabase in size, happened first uh, and the inversions happened later. And so we've uh, we tried to sort of make sense of this by looking at the phylogeny. Um, and we only had these assemblies from these three taxa here, um, but we were able to assemble a species tree um, based on Illumina resequencing data aligned to one of the reference genomes. Um, and this is based on several thousand genes, um, um, single copy orthologs among, among these species. Um, and then we looked at genes that are not in single copy, but are duplicated on chromosome 15 in, this, in these regions of light green here. And we saw that these uh, duplications, this copy number variation, actually goes deep in the phylogeny. So there are 
um, several other species that also have these duplications. Um, and we, we date that uh, origin of those gene duplications to about seven and a half million years ago. Um, and then we looked at phylogenies for these inverted regions. Um, and for each of these regions, we see a tree. So here I'm showing the species tree in gray and then the tree for the inversion itself uh, in green. And what we see is that the inversion tree doesn't match the species tree at all. In fact, one of the morphs of Denaeus chrysippus is most closely related to two other species, um, more closely related to them than it is to the other morphs. And so this inversion tree is absolutely discordant with the species tree. Um, and the hypothesis is that this inversion is old. It predated these two speciation events and was present in this ancestral population back here. Um, and then when this population that the species that occurs in the Americas dispersed probably from the old world to the Americas, it, it took one of these three variants of this inverted region with it. Um, and this dispersal event to Australia by a second species, again, took one of the three variants with it. And that left us with this discordant tree that we see today. And we actually see this pattern um, at each of the inver inversions, a slightly different pattern, but always a, a tree for the inversion that doesn't agree with the species tree. Um, and we find this quite interesting because in these taxa, this part of the genome is the part of the genome that defines these three groups, um, at least in terms of their four-wing coloration. Uh, and yet, they don't even group as the same species when we look at that part of the genome. And so um, some of my collaborators have been really puzzled about how we should think about these um, in terms of uh, what we should consider as a species here. I don't have a problem with considering this as a single cohesive species because it is just one chromosome that disobeys the species tree. Most of the genome does still play nicely, but it's important to keep in mind that just because this part of the genome is under strong selection doesn't mean it's going to be the part of the genome that tells the, the sort of truth uh, about the branching pattern um, for the genome on average. Um, and I'll end there uh, just to conclude. So in the first part, I showed that these ancient rearrangements have long lasting consequences because they alter recombination rate kind of indefinitely by lengthening chromosomes. That rearrangements that occurred recently that differ between species can strengthen the boundaries between them, even if it, they don't cause complete sterility. Um, and polymorphic rearrangements that are existing as polymorphisms in current populations can actually be very old, so old that they could predate speciation events and have discordant trees compared to the species branching pattern. Um, and with that, I've got many people to thank, but I'll just point out these five on the left here, Alexander McIntosh, Chris Jiggins, my ex-supervisor, um, John Davey, Kangwoo Kim and Rishi DeKine, um, and then lots of funding bodies. Not all of these are from grants I got. Um, some of these are from funding other people have got, but uh, these bodies have all funded um, parts of this work. Um, and thank you all for listening. Oh, thank you, Simon. Excellent. <laughs> There are a lot of things to think about in terms of speciation and the use of data and the use of phylogenies, how we interpret data. Um, I'll open the door now, open the door, open the floor um, for questions to Simon. Um, you're welcome to uh, raise your hand or just speak. Um, any, anyone, or anyone can now uh, ask questions. So if there are anyone, please indicate, you can start. I see you safe, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Simon, that was really, really interesting. Um, I was just curious about whether there were any inversions at all um, in the other chromosomes in the Danaeus uh, species and that aren't necessarily associated with differentiation of those particular uh, uh -huh. forms. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fantastic question. So 
we kind of did a sort of top-down search in that we knew the morphs we were looking at and we said what differentiates these morphs but you could do a bottom-up search and just say what what inversions are present and and perhaps they are under selection but under sort of different axes different geographic axes and some of them might, might be um under balancing selection in the form of super genes and things like that we're doing that search now we know about a couple more that are differentiated among the same morphs um, and then many others. So uh, I have an incoming PhD student who's already done an analysis on the genomes that we made and found um, close to 40 polymorphic inversions in these three species, of which a subset are geographically subdivided and others just seem to be floating around as polymorphisms. Um, and we don't know... Yeah, we don't we don't know whether this represents a sort of unusual, unusually large number, um, and whether these are under balancing selection or what kinds of selection they're under. Um, some of them do look old. There's at least one that looks even older than the ones we've that I was talking about today. There's there's one that actually you can hardly align it between the the different morphs. Um, so it probably goes back um, maybe between five and 10 million years of polymorphism. Is there anything that um, would, uh, that could potentially explain uh, or could point to a hypothesis that chromosome 15 is enriched for, you know, genes that determine um, uh, uh, wing color, mm -hmm like they might sort of end up kind of converging there. And maybe that's why um, that inversion happened so long ago, because it was also to do with, yeah. you know, color, color evolution. Uh, yeah, so so I think it's, it's possible, and we aren't there yet. We know it's quite hard when you find an inversion associated with a trait, it's quite hard to get down to the gene level, precisely because... Um, you don't get those recombination events in, in say, a, a cross where you're trying to map the gene um, or even a genome-wide association study. Um, but there are rare recombinations that occur within the inversions. And so we have been able to narrow down one gene, which is called yellow, um, within one of the inversions. That's a melanin synthesis pathway gene, and it's associated with, with the light-dark color variation. There are almost certainly other loci under selection that are probably being linked to being favored, the, the inversions are being favored because they link together a, a set of co-adapted alleles. Um, but yeah, it's going to take us a long time to to totally make sense of, of that and dissect them. Um, there's another thing I have to say about chromosome 15 though, which is those duplications are associated with, with high transposable element activity. And so those seem to be the first trigger of what of this sort of chromosome becoming interesting. Uh, and so it could have, could have actually been by accident at first that this chromosome became very uh, duplicate rich due to transposable element activity. And that led to non-homologous pairing and, and crossing over in meiosis, which can lead to other rearrangements. So in this paper, we actually suggested that the, rear, the, the, the inversions are probably a consequence of that initial um, higher transposable element activity it's almost like a snowballing kind of effect yeah and i guess if by chance it happens to capture um beneficial combinations of alleles mm. um in our in this case we think that it's there's because there's so much gene flow in this species that there's going to be selection favoring combinations of locally adapted alleles um keeping them together right. and, and sort of preventing them from mixing with these incoming one. So it, it might have just been a, 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 a situation that was sort of waiting for an inversion, but the inversion eventually came only after the, the TEs arrived. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Tony, to Oh, this is sorry, sorry I, I couldn't hear. Um, sorry, this is actually Nicola using Tony's computer. Um, 
thanks, Simon, for a really interesting talk. Um, it's just amazing how, how much information you've got there with all those mapped out um, loci and all. Um, I, I'm a taxonomist and I wanted to um, just go back to your comments about the species separation. I think it's so interesting mm -hmm. because um, when you've got a whole lot of genomic information like this, do you separate species qualitatively or quantitatively? So I, I'd just be curious, you know, just your thoughts on it since you, you work with this kind of data and you're familiar mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Um... <laughs> well, I, I guess I made the point early on that I we, we were looking for quantitative ways to describe the, um, the the tree because there is no single tree when when things are that closely related and there's gene flow going on. Um, and even even over deep evolutionary time, uh, depending on where you look in the genome, you can have a situation where there is no single tree. Uh, and I don't. I think that's fine. So <laughs> I'm perfectly comfortable with there not, with there not being one um, tree of life. Mm -hmm. I still think species uh, can be thought of as as real things um, because it doesn't mean that that the boundaries are necessarily always blurry. It just means that the that the tree is is an oversimplification of the pattern. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question um well i was just interested in your thoughts because it's you know like yeah the, the that chromosome 15 and the differences there are are so real and there's real observable differences that would yeah. probably satisfy a lot of taxonomists yes mm -hmm. yes and, i mean and these things do have names they they are named morphs and and i'm okay with that i i i i, I think i would say that i I don't want these to be named as different species because, um, well, it, it would make our old paper, our published papers harder to read because the names wouldn't match the uh, the future names. In fact, a, a name has already been changed uh, since the first paper we published on this group. So, um, and that was because somebody discovered that uh, that the type specimen had been a hybrid morph rather than the real morph or, or something um so I, I i guess my personal feeling is a little bit rather um i'm quite i'm fairly happy to stick with without splitting um with broader names for these things and and just talk about morphs uh rather than and i mean ideally i would want to talk about genotypes and i'd want to say that this this thing i'm talking about here has this allele um, we just aren't quite at that point yet um, to be able to do that because we haven't got sort of chromosome level assemblies for every individual we encounter. But if we had that, then we then we could do away with having to um, having to put it in a box, and we could rather say its genotype is this, and and in this particular study, we'll group all individuals with that genotype rather than um, having to make a taxonomic decision. I think that's where I'd lean. Thanks very much. Sure. So there's a question um, from Keir Lubbergland. Are there any hypotheses pertaining to the chromosome number stability across butterflies as a whole? In 31, across such a large order and span of time is remarkable. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's it's a great question, and I'm I'm ashamed to say that I I I had a I had a, a nice chat with Charlotte Wright, who's the author of that paper that um, I showed early on about this. And Charlotte has a has quite nice sort of model in mind. Um, and it, maybe I can share the paper in the chat here. Um, well, I I don't think I can find it, but if if one looks up Charlotte Wright on uh, I think Google Scholar. Um, you should be able to find it. The paper is just called Chromosome Evolution in Lepidoptera. Uh, I think th the clue is definitely this, this pattern of sort of bimodal pattern where there's stability and then periods of instability. And one of the ideas was that these periods of instability simply reflect something breaking uh, and some some very strict control on chromosome number being broken but that doesn't seem to be true because 
um, the yeah the periods of instability that Charlotte's describing seem to often only go in one way. So you see only fissions in one group uh, or only fusions in another group. So it's not, I guess it's, that suggests it's not just selection breaking, um, but maybe there's some, uh, something else mechanistic um, breaking. And I would suspect that if you do have that going on, that you have a period where lots of fissions happen, um, eventually selection will really favor um, bringing the chromosome number back to something manageable. There is one butterfly that has over 200 chromosomes. I think it's the eukaryote with the largest number of chromosomes. Um, and I would imagine that um, that over time selection will favor this thing returning to something around the range of 30. Uh, because many of these species have around the ancestral carrier type number, but actually many rearrangements that have happened. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a mixture of selection favoring a stable number but then also something mechanistic um, that that prevents fissions and fusions that that sometimes goes wrong um, but that would yeah that's just my that's just my speculation other questions Simon? yes it's Sam. thank you yeah, I think you you just kind of nullified my my question um, in the sense that if you have a hundred chromosomes, so one, my thoughts were, you know, how does it happen that you can have so many duplications? It feels like it's just out of control. Um, and and what is the if energy effect on on that? And and you know, how can it be maintained? And all those genes that are duplicated actually. Um, uh, uh, function. I don't know if you've looked at that. So, so the 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 set of duplications that I showed on on chromosome fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish I could say that we we've done it and we've got a fantastic clear result. We haven't got there yet. I looked briefly at sort of what these genes look like. They do by comparison with the best known insect. Um, in terms of gene function, which is Drosophila. And um, most of these are, there's, there's about 10 genes in that. In that. So it's, a, it's about a megabase, but it's actually very gene poor, that, that, that region. And it's filled with lots of transposable elements. And the genes that are in there, um, some of them are very high copy, but all of the high copy ones have no interesting name. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so that that's as far as I've got in terms of um, trying to figure out the the, uh, the the selection pressures involved. But I think you're right, Martin. I think it's very unlikely that something would exist as such high at, at such high copy number. And the other thing that's interesting is at the within species level, the copy number is extremely stable. So it's although it varies between even between these morphs, it varies, but then within morph, it's very stable. So I think that selection is acting on copy number there. It's just, we have, we have no idea. Um, I, I got uh, excited at first because not knowing much about, um, uh, about sort of proteins, I saw that one of the motifs that is present in some of these genes is immunoglobulin repeats, but apparently that's um, a very, very vague uh, motif and in insects, not very clear what it means. And, almost certainly isn't to do with the immune system. So, um, yeah, we're still completely uh, uncertain. And then um, you mentioned super genes. What did you mean with that? Mm. I, I use that term quite, um, quite liberally. So I'm... Uh, so I, I would say there's a classic definition and then there's a definition that I think um, extends further, but it still works. So the classic definition is any is a locus where recombination suppression links alleles at, at multiple loci, so multiple genes that are somehow co-adapted. And in the classic definition, there has to be some kind of epistasis. So, so having these two alleles together gives you um, a, a higher level of fitness 
than just the sum of the two parts and having only one or the other um, gives you some fitness cost. And so under that scenario, you would want to maintain um, these alleles together. And I think thinking back to my fungal days, uh, the mating type locus could be thought of as a super gene because I'd imagine that if you combined um, one of the mating type genes from a, a, a MAT1 locus to, with the mating type gene from a MAT2 locus, um, you'd probably lose fertility. And so that would be a massive cost of recombination. So that would be a classic supergene. Another example of a classic supergene could even be the sex chromosomes, where there's recombination suppression between X and Y, uh, and a whole bunch of genes that work together on the X and Y. Um, but then I would say that the extended definition also includes cases where there's adaptation to two environments and gene flow going on between them. Uh, and you can have uh, recombination su suppression being favored just to keep your locally adapted alleles from being kind of polluted by um, immigrant, by recombination with immigrant um, haplotypes. Uh, and that's been shown uh, theoretically to be a mechanism that would favor um, inversions, but only if there's quite a lot of gene flow going on, enough gene flow that there's a there's a cost to this um, mating with um, with immigrants and, and creating these offspring with mixed genotypes. So I would say that qualifies as a as a super gene as well. Um, yeah, and in the case of Danaeus, I think that it's the second one that um, is probably what evolved. It's, so even, although there's a very big polymorphic area, we don't think there's any benefit to the polymorphism. We think it's just a, it's just a, a lot of dispersal from these monomorphic regions into the hybrid zone that creates the polymorphism. Simon, I wish we had more time. <laughs> we, we can talk for hours. <laughs> but thank you again very much. Um, there were comments in the in the chat box if you want to look at it. One, one is there from Mike. Um, apologizing for leaving sooner to you, apologizing to you and to you, Anita. Um, so with that, Simon, thank you very much. I think we will have to move over now to you, Anita. And I think that am I still the, the captain of the Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Simon. So our yeah. next speaker is our student speaker for, for the webinars. So, um, Yonita, can you share your screen? Yes. Thank you. So, Yonita is one of our students here at the University of Pretoria in um, linked to Fabi and the Department of Biochemis uh, Biochemistry, Genetics and Microbiology. So, um, Yonita conducted her research under the supervision of Farnes, Emma, and me and some other collaborators. And I'm not going to talk much more about it, Yonita. I am looking forward to your talk. I don't think I have seen this talk yet. So even No, <laughs> it's the first time I'm presenting it. So, so I don't know if you can see my slides. So we move over from eukaryotic genomes to uh, bacterial genomes. Thanks, Yonita. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. So I haven't actually presented on this on this chapter. It brought order, like the title, which says "Centric Patterns Within and Between Braided Rhizobium Supergroups: Order, Order or Chaos." So it's brought a little bit chaos. I don't know if it's chaos or order in my PhD, but nonetheless. So I'm fortunate. So I work on braided rhizobium. And luckily or fortunate for me, they only have one chromosome. So just a little bit about braided rhizobium. So these are soil bacteria and they are known um, particularly for their nitrogen fixing symbiosis with um, legume plants. And on your left hand side, you see um, what, I'm oh, sorry, what these, um, what the nodules actually looks like. And they um, form these nodules um, on the roots um, of the legume plant. 
So how this typically works is through the nodulation process. So where the root hairs, they excrete flavonoids, and this is then um, signaled by um, for the rhizoba to attach to them, um, where it's first with a nod deregulator, and then it then um, sets off the nod genes, which encodes for nod factors. And these factors actually initiate um, what we see here as they call it a shepherd's crook or an infection thread, where the bacteria then um, gets engulfed in the root hairs. And from this, it then is able to go into um, the plant or on the roots, where they then form these nodules. Within the nodules, they um, fix nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, um, into a nitrogen source that the plant can actually use, so ammonia. So what we see in Braderized Hobium typically is that uh, members of this genus is diverse and they're associated with various legumes and non-legumes um, based on current um, research. And all of these um, legumes, they form, uh, they are in different environments or ecosystem. So the one um, which, um, is the agro ecosystems and they're usually known for their um one of the examples here is soya bean where soya beans is actually um they use plated rhizobium to increase yield of these crops we also find um herbaceous ecosystems where we see these bacteria associated with one of the examples that i just added here is the glodularia species um, and these herbaceous ecosystems, they usually occur in areas of course shallow soils, and they're often found on yield tops. Um, an example of this, which I said, is Grotularia. Then more on the forested ecosystems, where we actually find them in plantations. And this example is usually they're associated with acacia species. And up until recently, with um, metagenomics, they found um, bradyrhizobium to be associated with soil um, in the soil that's actually in forest um, plantations with other um, non legume that's non legume trees. So this I classified as unique bradyrhizobium because we have these um, rhizobia. Um, species that's associated with the soil they just found in soil. Um, and these are uh, bradyrhizobium species where they don't, they often don't have nod or nitrogen fixation genes. And also unique to bradyrhizobium, we have these photosynthetic bradyrhizobium where although they nodulate, um, they actually do so without the common nod genes. And what we see is, so this is a bradyrhizobium species phylogeny, which is based on 128 um, core genes. Also depicted in this picture is the presence and absence of what the three main characteristics of the genus or characteristic lifestyle traits of the genus, which is nodulation, nitrogen fixation, and photosynthesis. But what I want to um, bring to your attention here is that um, the diversity is encapsulated in this phylogeny. So the um, phylogeny is, so in this genus, seven lineages are recovered, and they are commonly referred to as supergroups and named according to the first species that was described in that supergroup. So we have Praderizobium japonicum, Kakaru, photosynthetic, um, Praderides over Malkani supergroup, the Chikame supergroup, and then we have these um, soil one and soil two, where um, the strains that's found in these lineages typically don't follow the uh, common nodulation and nitrogen fixation abilities, or even the photosynthetic um, abilities. So Previously, we also thought that the photosynthetic trait in braided rhizobium is actually limited to the photosynthesis, um, photosynthetic supergroup, but um, based on my previous work, we actually see that this trait is actually um, distributed in the phylogeny. So currently, comparative genomics within braided rhizobium looks at 
um, they focus on gene clusters pertaining to these important functioning um, role or lifestyle traits, such as your um, nitrogen fixation, um, where they look typically look at your NIF cluster, as well as the photosynthesis gene cluster, and they do um, syntony comparisons based uh, um, syntony comparisons within these clusters. There's also some studies where they look at the flagella cluster, as well as the type 3 secretion system, um, which typically um, there's been speculation that the type 3 secretion system is involved, um, somehow involved in symbiosis. And this brings me to what we actually wanted to investigate. So we see um, these small scale comparisons, genomic comparisons, but what um, what does the genomic architecture look um, like of Brady rhizobium um, when you look at the whole um, genome, so at, at a larger scale? And what we then did is we broke it up um, into two objectives and we looked, we evaluated the genomic synteny within and between Brady rhizobium supergroups by making use of com um, complete genome sequences that is publicly available and where we investigate the function of centenic regions. So just quickly, what is centeny? So um, originally, centeny has been defined as two or more genes um, being located on the same chromosomes. And this was whether there was a linkage between these genes or not. And in most recent studies or most studies done now, um, it usually refers to as the conservation of gene order and orientation among genomes. And it's usually, um, the term here is usually used as coloniality. Um, and based on this, we looked at synteny in regards to the second um, definition. So we looked at gene order and orientation. So looking at our Brady rhizobium species, we found that 67 complete um, genome sequences. So typically when doing, this is one of the challenges as well when looking um, or doing these comparisons, um, particularly in bacteria, because most of the reference, um, references that as a framework for synteny patterns is usually geared to eukaryotes and not so much done in prokaryotic species. So um, one of it we had to do look at was at complete um, genome sequences. And these um, genome sequences, so what we could find was genome sequences from five of the seven lineages. So we looked at any, um, which is the average nucleotide identity. And here we um, looked at um, the pairwise comparisons across shared genomic regions to obtain similarity values between genome pairs. And um, the use of average nucleotide identity is usually used to describe a species. So it's one of the matrices used um, in species description. And then next we did our synteny analysis and synteny was evaluated within and between supergroups. And in these analysis genomes are partitioned into synteny blocks um, where they look at collinear regions based on homology. And for this, I use chromata block. So this was the only program that I could at the time find that when it aligns to the reference, it keeps all of the information regarding um, irrespective of whether the other genomes has their genes or not that um, when compared to the reference. So I didn't want to, um, so for example, with your reference genome, when comparing um, all of the genomes, if in the event the other genomes did not have that um, did have a gene that the reference genome did not have. I didn't want um, the program to throw that out, but I wanted um, to include the whole genome. And synteny blocks, these synteny blocks um, or collinear regions were, um, that is based on homology is identified um, by using Cybelia. Um, and this is a program that is built in chromatoblock. Okay. 
Um, next, we wanted to see what the function of these um, centenic, what the functions of the centenic blocks is. And we put that through REST, um, where we did gene calling or gene prediction. We also used um, KEG where, um, with Ghost Koala, which it assigns function, and also a KO number. And using this KO number, we were able to then minimize or find a way of how we can collect um, collect all of this information in a, in a way that we can actually make sense out of it. And we use Kick Dakota for that. So um, this is what the results looks like. So this um, is an example of what it looks like across um, the, the genus, so between um, supergroups. So I'm just going to explain the first, um, so the first picture. Um, so these are alignments of what the genome architecture looks like. And we have um, the arrangement of core genes um, these core blocks, which is um, in these solid colors. And then these are centenary blocks that is found in all the genomes. And then we also have these non-core blocks, which occurs in some of um, the genomes. And the core blocks is arranged according to the first genome. And at the bottom, we have our, um, our any um, analysis where the bottom triangle um, is the pairwise comparisons um, across shared genomic regions. And these are mean similarity values between genome pairs. And at the top, the top triangle, which is in gray, is the proportion of the genomes that were um, homologous, actually. So these are the proportion of the, um, of the genomes that is similar to one another. So what we actually see, so we worked out the centenary coverage, and the centenary coverage was calculated by um, taking the total number of centenary blocks that we found um, and dividing it by the genome um, size. And what we see across the genus, we actually see these, how low the centenary is with, um, between supergroups. Um, however, the any values across the genus we see it ranges um, from seven, from about 75% to 88%, which is um, shown in the bottom triangle. With, um, and when we look at the gray, um, at the, the gray triangle at the top, we see that 40% um, with more than 40% of the compared genomes is homologous. So what this actually tells us is that so in this genus-wide comparisons, prioritized ovum genomes generally, they lack um, these collinearity across um, extended chromosomal regions um, while retaining these high levels of homology actually at smaller scales, which we see with the percentage. But what I actually just need to... Um, Bring across is that what your what centenary analysis um, this takes in account all of the genomes, whereas with any um, it actually just does a pairwise um, similarity. So based on this, we also see an indication of mesocentenary, where this has been described. Um, this type of centenary was first described in fungal species. And mesocentony is a pattern that is characterized by conservation of gene content in chromosomes without um, conservation of gene order or gene orientation. And we actually see all of these disruption that actually occurs genus wide. And this is to be expected when during millions of years of evolution, this large genomic um, rearrangements with mobile genetic elements that contributed to the disruption of these collinear blocks. And also with the expansion of accessory genomes, because what we know in bacteria, especially soil associated bacteria, um, they typically have a large um, pan genome. 
So the picture changes um, when we look at what happens within um, supergroups. So typically our synteny that the genomic synteny that we observe within these, um, within the supergroup, we see um, patterns of macrosynteny, which is indicated by those large um, regions of um, collinear blocks and conservation of synteny between um, genomes. But we also see that they have these um, a synteny coverage that is over that ranges from high, from about high 40s um, to 50s. So when we look um, at the within a species, so we typically focus when we started this, um, we wanted to look at what happens within and between supergroups, but with Japonicum and how large the Japonicum lineage is, we had the opportunity to actually see um, what happens within species because we had quite a few representatives um, of what happens within a species. And we see that um, these macro um, synteny patterns as well within a species. And we actually see quite high um, number so high synteny coverage is seen within um within within species which is which was to be expected but what we did not expect was what happens in soil two supergroups so these are usually these are just soil bacteria they don't have not or nerve genes we're not sure what their function is in the environment as well and we see that synteny within the supergroup is extremely low um, which is ranges from 3.5 percent to four um, and this could be um associated, so they soil associated strains where they're more variable to accommodate um, the heterogeneous environment that they find themselves in, which is the soil, and constantly have to adapt to the changes in the environment. However, we probably need to include um, more strains to have a look at this again. And, um, and if it changes the picture, so coming to chromosomal um, rearrangement. So this was the best from what I've explored with the programs. It was typically the best way in which we could see um, rearrangements happening in um, prairie rhizobium. So we have inversions that's happening and translocation. So in the red boxes, we have these um, inversions that occur. Uh, and in the blue boxes is indicative of the translocation that happens. I'm not sure, we're not sure actually what drives these translocations and inversions um, in bacteria. And it would have to actually, we would have to focus or have a look at this a little bit more. But inversions and translocations in, um, in bacteria in general um, has said to be quite a common uh, occurrence um, in, bacteri in bacteria. And this is usually due to these rep um, repetitive sequences that bacteria has, which, um, in, which can influence or disrupt um, the genome's stability when um, recombination occurs or during replication and ultimately interfere overall um, gene expression. However, in some cases in other bacteria, it has been reported that large inversions or transloca and translocation can actually be associated with biological um, costs where they actually facilitate the um, adaption within the environment that the bacteria finds themselves in. Um, as for the selection forces that actually drives, like I said, um, why these inversions and translocation happens, particularly in braided isobium, um, that would, we would 
really need to have a look at. So the next thing we looked at was the function um, of these genes. And just a summary of what we found in the functioning of the centenic blocks. So over here, the scale is, um, it represents the pathway completion. So um, when it is the dark red, it means that that pathway has all of the genes needed for that pathway um, for it to happen. And what we also see within here is that it's very lineage specific. So the roles that they play is very lineage specific. Um, just for example, um, within the photosynthetic um, supergroup, we see that um, when we had a look at this, we, it has all of the photosynthetic the photosynthesis genes um, that is needed for photosynthesis to take place. And with, with these um, four um, strains um, that, that shows this photosynthesis has actually been tested within these strains. So I'm going to conclude um, on this slide where the synteny and the gene order is generally, um, we generally see it um, between, so the synteny and the gene order that we see within and between um, the supergroups, it corresponds um, to what we see phylogenetically. So synteny, um, we see high amount of synteny between genomes that is phylogenetically closely related then when distantly related in terms of when we look at genus wide, um, at the genus wide level. And we see patterns both resembling a mesocentony and macrocentony um, with, um, within supergroups and within species. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge everyone that was involved um, in this chapter. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Yorita. <clears throat> Wonderful presentation. Any questions for Yorita? Just going to put my video on. Yorita, there are many people clapping hands. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciation. I think that I think the chapter gave me extra few grays. <laughs> I think for us <laughs> in a way also. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any questions for you, Anita? Anita, I think it's getting late here. Yes. Um, by the way, Yonita is not in South Africa. She's actually doing, taking on a postdoc. So she sits in Mallorca, Mallorca and enjoying herself. Um, but there's a question from Simon. Yes, Simon, please, please ask. Hi, Yonita. Thanks for that talk. Um, this is maybe not an expected question, but just thinking about the Previ the previous data that I showed, yes. I couldn't help but think about polymorphism. And if you had to have more uh, representatives from each of these species, do you think you would find consistent patterns within species? Or do you think that, especially in some of these groups where your inversion is only in one or two of the species in that group, do you think that maybe it's a partly just a just a sort of you happened to sequence an individual that had an inversion or do you think they yeah maybe you have data on that so the thing is so I wouldn't necessarily I'm not sure actually because the genus is so so there's a bit of sampling bias when it comes particularly to um graded rhizobium and maybe um rhizobia at large um because Originally, the genus is known for its nitrogen fixation and its nodulation abilities that we only now seeing how diverse um, the genus is actually. 
So whether the pattern that we see within species, my feeling is that it it won't change. That is, mm -hmm. I think that's that's my feeling that it won't change. Uh, depending on what I have seen is depending on branching patterns when you refer it back to phylogenetics. Um, so that inversions that we do see within that within that species actually um, that last four species. Um, or strains of that species, it typically looks like it is maybe it's like they, they diversifying, if I can put it that way, um, mm -hmm. because we do see there's quite a lot of differences um, between that. But I, my feeling is that it, I don't think it will change. Okay. Can I, if I, can I ask a second one, Martin? Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, so it's one of the questions I got was about sort of parts of the genome that are more prone. And you spoke about these repeats. Yes. Um, so do you think uh, something that sometimes people ask me is whether these things ever uninvert? So do you think that you could, it would be possible at the phylogenetic scale to show if, if you know, if it only ever goes in one way, or if you can have sort of things back arranging to the ancestral gene order? So what I've actually read, that I can't remember the particular bacteria that they were looking at, was some of these changes is permanent. Mm -hmm. um, and there was others that can actually revert back. Um, but that depended on where, of the, where on the genome those um, inversions or those mm -hmm. rearrangements occurred, actually. Yeah. Great. Thank yes. you. Um, there's just a comment. I think it's from Nicola. Thanks very much for your presentation, Yonita. It was fascinating to be able to think about and look at comparisons of chromosomal patterns across these very different groups. I think with that, we can conclude. Um, once again, our thanks to Simon and to Yonita. We really enjoyed listening to you. Um, thank you for your, for, for, for your for everything for, for, for dealing your knowledge with us and your research. We're looking forward to future interactions. Simon, um, Yonita, we just continue with what we do with you, not with you yes. <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, oops, oops. Um, so and then I wish all all attendees a wonderful evening. Um, Stay out of the cold and do not get sick. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Simon's in, in summer. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's Scotland, so can you really call it that? <laughs> My understanding is that a high felt winter is like an English summer. So, no. <laughs> The difference is in Highfield winter, the temperature goes up when the sun comes out. <laughs> what can I say, Simon? You're the one choosing to be in Scotland. Um, I am. I am. <laughs> but it's lovely to hear you. And it does occur to me that we should, we, you, you, you mentioned the Matt Lowe side. We should.